when we've gone through this and we've got our A, B, C, D, E, F, G, whatever, then we shoot a pencil test. We take it, we put it underneath the camera, and we expose it for the arbitrary two frames per second, and then we play it back and we see that it's going way too fast because everything's just going right through. So obviously we've got to determine how long is this going to take. And that's where the decision-making process of you as the animator kicks in. You have to say to yourself, how long do I want it to take? Okay, and you make a decision. And so what you do is you expose this drawing for let's say 20 frames. Okay, and then you expose this one for 24 frames. And you play it back and you say, does that look right? Does that make sense? If it doesn't, you answer the question, is it too fast or is it too slow? If it's too fast, take away frames and it'll slow it down. If it's too slow, add frames, or sorry, the other way around. <laughs> If it's too slow, you take away frames, and if it's too fast, you add frames. Okay? Until you get a sense visually as to whether or not it's working. Right? So once you've figured out that it's working okay, you then start to count the number of frames that you have in between, and you can decide what your timing is going to be. So that's where we get into timing charts now. On your first drawing, you draw a little chart that looks like this. Put a little line across like this, and then you extend a line up like this, to about there, and you put another tick at the top. So this tick down here at the bottom is for this drawing number one. And then what we do is we have to determine how many drawings we're going to put in between here to get to the next drawing, which in this case is B, which I don't have a number for yet, but I will in a few seconds once I determine my, my, my timing. So determining timing is a matter of aesthetics. You look at it and you get a sense of whether or not it feels right. But there are standard timing charts. There are five basic types of timing charts that we're going to use. So on a separate sheet of paper, let's just draw out the different options that you're going to have. So in any general given circumstance, and this is a, a fairly loose but somewhat rigid rule, um, anytime you put it in between, between two key positions, it's usually always halfway in between. Right? It's half the distance. So what we do is on our chart, we indicate half the distance between our two keys here and here. So visually, we can see that on this chart, it's halfway. Now, sometimes what they'll do is an animator will put a little arc, just a light little arc like this, just to say this is halfway. So this type of a timing chart is called a half. H A L. Now the variation on that is if we start to add more in-betweens in here and we subdivide it again into quarters, it's still a halfway position. So this is our pure half, but half the distance between these two points here is this one here, which is a quarter, but it's actually still a half. Right? So these are called halves, where it subdivides it equally. So now if we count the number of frames that we're going to shoot this, if we're shooting it at two frames per drawing, that means that this is two, four, six. So we've got six frames here, which is one quarter of a second. Still pretty fast. So usually going from one position to another position, that indicates a very fast action. Now, we're not just talking about time here, but we also have to consider distance. Right? So if we have a, a key position that's here, let's say, and another key position that's right there, very close to it on the paper, half the distance would go right there. This, six frames for that type of a distance, would be probably appropriate. Okay? It's a shorter distance, and therefore that one quarter of a, a, a second would be appropriate. However, if I had a key here and a key over here, and I dropped a halfway in between there, that's a big distance. That means that's going to go very quickly. Okay, as opposed to this. Right. So visually we have to understand both the distance that we're moving and the amount of time that we're allotting to it. We'll be getting into instances where we can do this, but there are ways that we have to fill that drawing in properly. They're called smears or blurs or strobes. We'll get into it later. Okay, so we've got our two halves here. We can continue to subdivide this equally all the way through and just add in more frames. So right now the way I've got this one, it's two, four, six, eight, ten. This is ten frames now. 
which is just under half a second. So if I do another one here and I subdivide it again in halves, I'm adding in more frames and more drawings, I've now got 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, which is 3 quarters of a second. Now the problem with this type of an action from here to here is it's mechanical. It's all going at an evenly spaced distance all the way through. So it's like a, an elevator door. Okay, You press the button and the door opens and it goes click stop. Or a garage door, you press the button, your garage door goes ka-chunk, ka -chunk, and it stops. Right? What we usually do in real life is we have a buildup of our momentum, which is what we call an animation. It's called a slow in, or on the opposite side when you're coming to a stop, it's called a slow out. So the equivalent of this would be if you're driving in a car, and you turn it, like you know the sequence of events that you would use for driving a car, right? You hop in the car, you put on your seatbelt, you stick the key in the ignition, you turn it on, just one second, and you step on the gas. Are you instantly going 100 kilometers an hour? No. No. Because the g-forces involved in that would force your eyeballs into the back of your head. Literally. You would die because you're going too fast, too suddenly. And so if we put the opposite on it, at the back end, if you're driving 100 kilometers an hour in your car, and you suddenly come to an instant stop, you go right through the windshield. It's like hitting a brick wall. Either way, you're going to die without slow ins or slow outs. Okay? So we have to build the momentum up gradually over time. That's why you see your speedometer when you step on the gas, it goes unless you're you know, really tromping on the gas, then you go like that, and it goes up faster. It just means you're doing a faster slow in. Right? So in order to achieve that, what we do is we have a timing chart that looks like this. We have a halfway, which is the, the automatic, we always have a halfway position. But by doing just this, it automatically creates what's called the slow in. Because the distance from here to here and here to here is less than the distance here to here. So we're building up speed as we go along. We can continue to add in-betweens over here. So that we're doing smaller increments over here and building up our speed. Each one gets incrementally larger. And another one in here. Okay, you can keep adding them towards the key, as many as you want to fill in that space, depending on how long you want it to take. So from what I've got right here right now, I've got 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. Just over half a second to get up to my full rate of speed. Okay? So there's 14 frames altogether there. This is called a slow in. S-L-O dash in. Now, the opposite of that is when we're coming to a stop, we put what's called a slow out on the opposite side. So we go to our automatic half, then we half this one on the opposite side going into our stop position, and then we just continue to half it all the way down for as many frames as we want to. Yeah? What, isn't it the opposite? Because an accelerated motion would be a slow out, and a decelerated motion would be a slow in. You can flip-flop the terms either way. Okay, it just depends on the view that you're looking at it from. So I call this a slow in because we're slowing into the action. But isn't that an accelerator because it the is. space is faster? It is, but it's just, I, the term is, is, it's not important. I mean, you can flip-flop it. You call this a slow out if you want to. Or you can call this a slow in to your key. Yeah. We're slowing into the action coming from your stop position, or we're slowing out of the action. Okay. Your action is down here. We're slowing out okay. to the end. Okay, so it, the terms are flip flop. It doesn't just the theory that's important here. All right. So in this case here, we're slowing out of the action or slowing into the key over here. So we call this a slow out. All right. I think I blew people's minds. Sorry. <laughs> well, it, the terms are interchangeable. Okay, it, you can either call it a slow in or you can call it. It doesn't matter. The idea is that we're gradually building up speed or gradually decelerating, right? That's the idea, is you don't want stuff to be abrupt. You never want something to suddenly come to a stop abruptly, which is what your evenly spaced in-betweens would do. And this is what about this last week, that people think that computers do all the work for you. They don't. Computers are mathematical instruments that when you give them a start position and a stop position and you say, take 10 drawings or 10 frames to do this, it will subdivide it equally. 
There is no such thing as a slow in or a slow out to the computer. You actually have to go into what's called a graph editor and manipulate the graph in order to create a gradual slow in or slow out to it. Okay? So again, it's, it's you manipulating the computer to tell it what to do. It won't do it for you. Right? So we got halves, we've got slow ins or slow outs. A variation of the half, and this is only in rare instances, and I'll explain why you might do it, would be what's called thirds, where we subdivide the space into thirds here. The reason for thirds is this. If we have an action that's going from here to here, and our total is six frames, and we find that it's too fast, and so we drop in two in-betweens on either side here, and it changes it to 10 frames, it's too slow now. So what we do is we do this. We put it on thirds, so we've got two, four, six, eight. Eight frames. So it's half the time between six and 10, and this could turn out to be exactly right. Okay. So you wouldn't want to default to a slow in where you're doing this instead. You put the halfway position there, which this one here is too fast, you don't want to put quarters in because it's too slow, but you do this, and you still end up with eight there total, but you've got to slow in on the one side. You still want it to be a constant rate, so you divide it into thirds instead. Okay? Which is a little bit tricky, because if you've got a distance from here to here, you have to find the one third. Ha finding a halfway position is easy. You just put it halfway in between. But to find the one third position is a little bit more difficult it's easy once you get your one-third position because then you're half way over here to get your other third. Right? So it's just getting that one first one done, which is the tricky part. Okay? But it's an option if you want to get your timing precisely halfway in between. So I'm sure some of you are asking yourselves, what's the difference between six frames and ten frames? Is it that big a difference? Yeah, it can be sometimes. It can be the difference of one frame can make a difference. I've played around with animation where I've shot the whole thing on twos and find that certain parts are a little bit too slow and so what I do is I go in and I take one drawing and I knock it down to ones and then play it back and all of a sudden it's nice and crisp and it works really well. Okay, So yeah, a frame can make a huge difference. The general public won't notice it but aesthetically you as a professional have that control to play around with it. And that's what we're always striving for is, you know, perfection in our animation, trying to make it the best it can be. And so that allows a little bit of leeway for it. So we've got halves, slow in, slow out, and we've got thirds. Oh yeah, I forgot, we can also have a combination of a slow in and slow out. Okay, you can combine those together where you take your timing chart like this, you put the halfway here, and then you've got to put quarters on either side, but then you can slow in over here, and you can slow out on this side over here. So you can have something starting here, I can slow in, go to a constant rate, and then slow out on the opposite side. Okay. But again, it just depends on the type of action that you're doing. So then our final option now, because we've got halves is one, slow in is two, slow out is three, and thirds is four, we've got our fifth option, which is called a cushion or a favor. Okay. Cushion or a favor. Those are the two interchangeable terms. The reason why it's called a cushion sometimes, and that cushion would go over here, because it's favoring this key, okay? The reason we call it a cushion is, uh, I guess the best analogy I can give you is, let's say you're in Fred Flintstone's house, and all of his, his furniture is rock granite, and you go to jump on it, you're going to hit it really hard. Throw a cushion on it, and you go, ah, that feels a little bit better. It just softens up that impact point, okay? So it's not as abrupt. So you can combine this with any of these here, except for the slow in and slow, because it's a form of a slow in, but it's just more of an abrupt slow in. So you might throw it in something like this here, where you've got a distance from here to here. You could put a favor up here towards the key, or you can put a favor over here towards this key. Or same thing on this one here. Put a favor over here or a favor over here. On the thirds, you can put the favor over here or the favor over here. So the favor always goes right next to a key position. Right? Now, one of the major things that you can't do is you cannot slow down an action in the middle of an action. 
unless you're doing some sort of a special effect, like characters throwing a ball and you want to go slow motion, and then it speeds up and hits the end. Okay, but that's only a special effect. Usually whenever you have something that's moving from one point to another, like later on we're going to do a pendulum swing, when you start your pendulum over here and it swings down like this, you're not going to slow it down in the middle like this and then speed it up to this side. What's causing it to slow down? Okay. There's nothing there that's causing it to slow down. Momentum is building, gravity is pulling it down, and it's going to go its fastest right here, and then it's going to slow down because gravity grabs onto it, and its weight is going to pull it back down. Okay. Which gets us into... Sir Isaac Newton <laughs> and his laws of physics. And one of his laws of physics is that once you set an object into motion, it continues in motion until something affects it. Okay? Whether it's a surface, texture of some sort, or gravity, or another object that will cause it to stop and change its direction. In a character, the most obvious things are that are going to affect your character are A, gravity, because okay, your character can't just be floating in the air, right? Unless they're in outer space for some reason. They have to be grounded to the ground. So when a character jumps up, eventually gravity's going to take over and it's going to pull them back down and they're going to descend back down to the earth. The other thing that's going to affect your character are their muscles. When you push some part of your body in one direction, eventually you're going to reach a point where you A, are going to lose your balance and fall down, or you correct yourself by counterbalancing yourself and pulling yourself back over by affecting your muscles and causing one part of your body to shift to another position. Okay? So we're going to do an example of this. Okay, so everybody stand up and move your chairs so that they're out of your way. Slide them into the table. Oh, sorry. Okay, so everybody stand up and what I want you to do is just stand comfortably. Um, we're going to move in this direction here, so stay where you are. Okay? But I just want you to stand very comfortably with your, your feet roughly about shoulder width apart and your hands just relaxed at your side. Now, I'm going to describe to you what we're going to do. Very simple action, but I don't want you to do it yet. Okay? Just wait until I explain what we're going to do. We're going to take a step with your left foot. Okay? I'm going to go in the same direction as you. I'm going to go in this direction over here. Everybody's going to move this way. You're going to take and move your left foot and take one step to your left. Okay. Your mark, get set, go. Okay. Now, let's go back to the right now. Stop. Who can tell me what's the very first muscle in your body that you use in order to get that action to take place? You have to shift your hips. So what's the very first muscle that you use? Leg. The very first muscle in your body that tends to you don't know because I didn't ask you to think about it, but everybody right now is going like this. <laughs> okay, what I want you to do is again, stand, just relax. Okay. Now this time I want you to concentrate and think about your body. Okay. And I want you to move in super slow motion right now. Ready? And go. Okay, did you feel it? What was the first muscle? Was the leg. Muscle. What muscle? No. The greater trochanter is the bone, so that one. Okay. Go back to your, your relaxed position. <laughs> just relax. Don't go all jelly-like, but just relax. Okay. Super duper duper slow motion now. What you're going to do is I'm going to step through it with you, okay? What you're going to do is in order to move in that direction, you have to lift your leg off the ground, right? So, by standing still, in order to lift your leg off the ground, what you have to do is you have to shift your hip in this direction. In order to move your hip, you have to tighten your abdominals slightly. It's your abdominals that will tighten up initially. You're just going to tighten them up slightly to tense and hold this part steady. And then what you're going to do is you're going to pop your hip. By doing that, you're basically shifting your body in this direction here in order to counterbalance so that you can allow this foot to come off the ground. Your head goes further out here in order to allow you to lift your foot up off the ground. And then what you do is you pop your head in this direction with your hip. And gravity takes over and it pulls you over. You cushion yourself on this side. And then notice what happens to your head. Your head has to go too far over this way in order to counterbalance and allow you to lift your foot off the ground. And then when you shift your weight back, you go too far this way. And you settle back this way. And then you come to a full stop. Okay. So what we've got in that action is anticipation, 
We're going in the opposite direction that we actually want to go because we have to lift our leg and counterbalance ourselves. We anticipate, we do the action, we recover, and react, and settle. Okay? Anticipation, action, reaction, and final recovery. Those are the basic principles of any type of a movement. If we didn't utilize that, and some people can, you can't do this without anticipating. All you have to do is just pop your head in this direction and lift your foot and you'll fall over. Okay? Gravity takes over. And some people can do that. You can just go whoop like that really quickly. Okay? But it's an abrupt movement. So we can exaggerate it as well. Okay, we can do this. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's a big anticipation. The purpose of an anticipation is to build up momentum for the action that's going to take place, but it's also to prepare the audience to say, I'm getting ready to do something, and now I'm doing it. And then you have the natural repercussions of what's going to happen. Another example, you guys can sit down. 